Hi, I'm John McAuliffe, Chief Marketing Officer of VFM Leonardo, and welcome to VTV. VTV has been produced for hotel e-commerce, marketing, and sales professionals to provide insights, knowledge, and learnings from industry experts on how to extract more value from a hotel's presence on the internet. Each week, I interview an industry expert on a single topic. We have discovered many of these topics from industry people like yourself and encourage you to let us know if there is a topic you would like us to cover on future episodes. You can email us at vtv at vfmleonardo.com and make your suggestion anytime. Today, I am joined by Henry Hardevelt. Henry is Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. Henry is a well-known and well-respected expert in the travel industry and conducts research and consulting that helps travel industry e-business and channel strategy professionals worldwide understand and anticipate how technology will impact the way they market, sell, and distribute their products and services. Over the course of five specific topics, Henry and I will discuss the impact of the internet on travel shopping and how hoteliers can turn the internet channel from pain to panacea. Henry, thank you for joining us and welcome to VTV. Thanks, John. I appreciate being invited. Our topic uh, overall is e-business for hoteliers, panacea or pain. Uh, it is well known that the internet has radically changed how consumers shop for travel. And this has had a dramatic impact on how hoteliers market, sell and transact the booking of hotel rooms. In many ways, the internet uh, has made what some would argue is another electronic booking channel, a very complex environment for hoteliers, in particular, forcing them to change the way that they market and sell to travel shoppers. What was once the domain of uh, channel distribution executives at the hotel chain now requires and impacts those in marketing and e-commerce at the chain, management company, and hotel level. Change is difficult, and change as it relates to e-business is even more difficult due to its rapidly changing environment. Some hoteliers find this a pain and are struggling with how to extract more value out of their presence online, while others have found success and, as our title suggests, panacea. Henry, you've recently published a number of research reports and in many of them, you talk about a segment of the online travel shopper called the content-sensitive traveler. Let's talk about this travel shopper segment, and in particular, how to motivate the content-sensitive traveler online to book. First, can you start by telling us, what is the content-sensitive traveler? Sure, John. Um, Forrester researches consumers on an ongoing basis. Uh, surveys between 4,000 and 5,000 uh, uh, some, and sometimes as many as 60,000 uh, uh, people uh, each quarter. Uh, in our Q1 2009 online travel study that we fielded in North America, we asked a question about whether travelers uh, actively uh, avoid hotels where they don't see either the written or visual content that makes them feel comfortable about booking that hotel. And what surprised us was that 38% of the hotel guests that responded to that question said they do avoid hotels that uh, don't have adequate content. That 38% of the hotel guests are what we call the content sensitive traveler. And that equates to 47.5 million US hotel guests right now. Uh, it's interesting, Henry. Uh, that's, a, that's a large population of online travel shoppers. Um, is there any deeper understanding as to uh, the makeup of that content-sensitive traveler uh, and whether there are different segments within there? Sure. I, first, you're right. It is an enormous number. And I think what's important for hotel uh, e-business professionals to understand and the firms that they work with is that content is critical to helping you be more successful in securing that sale. Uh, hotels uh, spend a fortune on the construction and design and furnishing of that hotel, uh, spend a lot of money building out websites, and yet sometimes content is given short shrift. 
What we know about the content-sensitive traveler is that they travel more often. Uh, they spend about 22% uh, more on their uh, leisure travel each year, more than $7,000 a year uh, uh, on their travel, which is 22% above the average uh, uh, traveler. And they're younger. Uh, more than half are what we call the next generations of traveler, people between the ages of 18 and 43. But 35% of these content-sensitive travelers are baby boomers, and 7% are seniors. Basically, there is no one in this group that you really want to annoy or ignore. So it sounds like there's two uh, key components there. One is, is that it sounds like they're a premium guest. Um, and the second is, is that they are, uh, although they cover off many different segments, uh, they are more populated with the, the next, call it the next generation of traveler or the younger traveler that certainly has a larger uh, life cycle of, of time uh, to, uh, to tr uh, uh, travel. And, yes, and you're right. Travel. I mean, the, the, uh, the content sensitive traveler, uh, because the fact that they are concentrated in that 18 to 43 age group, has uh, more travel um, uh, ahead of them than do some of the other members of the audience, especially compared to the people who are not content sensitive. But what's really important to understand about that content sensitive traveler, because they are younger, they are more likely to be optimistic about technology and to find a role for it in their lives. They are more likely to be using the internet, whether it's through traditional internet or mobile internet, uh, in their everyday life. So their natural gateway uh, to your organization will be online. They're less likely to want to call. Be not, not only do they spend more for their travel, more of them are willing to consider affordably priced premium products, whether that's for more comfort or for added savings, uh, uh, excuse me, whether that's for more comfort or for uh, added convenience. So you really want to make sure that the content is not only merchandising the logical uh, portions of your hotel, such as sleeping accommodations, public spaces, restaurants, but you want to make sure that you're using your written content and especially visual content also to merchandise features and amenities that make your brand, your product, your hotel stand out, whether it's a spa, a golf course, a meeting facility, uh, a bedding program, a dining uh, a program, um, almost anything. There is no detail too small. Uh, it sounds like uh, within that uh, you had started giving us some ideas on what hoteliers can do specifically uh, to appe appeal to the content sensitive traveler. Are there a number of uh, you know top three, top five types of of uh, recommendations that you would give to a hotelier uh, to focus on in order to uh, appeal to the content-sensitive traveler? Uh, yeah, John, to appeal to the content-sensitive traveler, first really uh, think about your content. Don't ignore it. The number one thing I would say is content matters. It is uh, critically important to putting money in the bank. So bring in a professional copywriter to write your content. Use uh, short uh, paragraphs, no more than four or five lines, and augment them with bullet points. Uh, make sure that the copywriter understands your brand and the level of product. If you're an economy-focused hotel, for example, or budget hotel, don't bring in a copywriter whose focus is luxury goods. Uh, they won't understand or be able to write as effectively to your audience. Make sure that the visual content uh, uh, that you have uh, reflects the details so, for example, uh, make sure that you have pictures of each different room category, not just bedding types, single beds or double beds, but if you have a view room, make sure that the drapes are open and that you have uh, video or still photography, preferably both, of that view. Uh, if you have different uh, types of uh, different grades of rooms, you need to have pictures as well as well-written descriptions uh, of each of those different types or grades of rooms. Focus on the details that make each room stand out, especially where there's an upsell involved. So for example, if you have a standard room and a better category room, uh, help the customer who's looking at this online understand why one uh, room grade is better than the other. 
Think about using a matrix or grid to help uh, that content-sensitive traveler understand at a glance what's featured or offered in the different rooms uh, so that it's easy for them to understand. The great thing about good content is it can help shift that booking decision away from price and more towards value. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you'll get someone to go from a $49 room to a $4,900 presidential suite. But it does mean that at the end of the day, at the end of that transaction, your guest will walk out of there feeling that they got the room that really meets both rational and emotional needs at a price that he or she feels they can afford to pay. So it sounds like there's a great opportunity for hoteliers to use content, both uh, descriptive or textual and visual, to um, uh, tell their story to the travel shopper in a way that's detailed uh, and organized, but also relevant uh, to that person and what they're looking for in a hotel. Absolutely. Think of, of your, using your content almost in a funnel-like manner. Uh, you want to have some shots that are great for, if you will, high-level viewing. I don't mean literally bird's eye, but uh, quick at a glance. And then you want to allow that customer to dive deeper, to get more details. Uh, provide contextual information. Uh, a matrix or grid is really good for this so that, again, people understand details such as room size and dimensions. Maybe certain uh, rooms have higher ceilings or larger windows or balconies um, uh, or uh, uh, other items that make them better or more appealing. Uh, provide that information to the traveler uh, and make sure it's easy for them to discover. Don't hide the content. Too often we actually find that good content may exist on a site, but it's not there. Uh, it's too difficult to find uh, from the navigation. Uh, and make sure that uh, if you're at the chain level, your properties understand the importance of this uh, and that you're working with them and educating them on the importance of this. And if you're at the property level and you've got questions, make sure that your colleagues at the corporate level are able to answer those questions for you. Uh, you know, content really is king. And too often, the only content we pay attention to is price. That's not going to really be as useful as, as you think. Uh, you need to have good written descriptions and good visual content because ultimately, the web is a channel that we scan. And think about it as really a way to woo that customer and get them more involved uh, with your product, with your brand, with your property. Henry, thank you very much. Uh, this is a great uh, lead in to the next topic that we're going to cover, which is the role of visual content in travel shopping. Great. Henry, welcome back. Thanks, John. Um, now, let's address this uh, topic of the role of visual content in uh, travel shopping. You recently published a, a research report titled, Poor Content Could Cost Travel E-Business Money. Based on this research, what do you see as the role of visual content in online travel shopping? You know, John, the role of visual content is to help the traveler understand what your brand or product or property is all about. Uh, because while words are important, online we scan, we don't read. But what's really, really important about visual content is to help people understand uh, why they should consider you in the first place. You can't count on people being brand loyal. Uh, our research shows that the number of brand loyal travelers has fallen every year since 2002. And while loyalty programs are good, they are not relevant to every guest. Visual content helps you break through the clutter, helps you get into that consideration set, and really helps people understand why you are worth the prices you want to charge. But visual content can also help you uh, secure a customer who may be brand neutral or brand agnostic. And if you're at the hotel, whether it's corporate or property level, management level, whatever, uh, if you are on the supplier side, good content can help you get that customer not only to shop on your site, but to book on your site. Good visual content can help provide context to the guest about your different types of accommodations, about the different types of properties you have, the different destinations, the restaurants, lounges, features that you offer, uh, bedding programs, 
spa, whatever it is that you have. And even if you're just a very simple hotel, a two or three star uh, hotel budget, economy, limited service without food and beverage, good visual content can still make that customer feel your hotel is just that much more relevant for him or her than the other hotels that they're shopping. Henry, there's different types of visual content uh, out there, whether that's uh, by media type or, or style of, of, um, of visual content. So, you know, in a simple way of looking at it, photos or virtual tours, videos, etc. Um, do, does the type of visual content uh, change uh, on the influence of the travel shopper based on the stage at which they're at in the travel planning process? Well, you know, John, I think a lot depends on the nature of the hotel and the type of product that's being considered. Um, uh, you know, certainly for the individual traveler uh, and for meeting planners and travel agents, still photography is most critical. Uh, still photography is the absolute bare minimum that you have to have. Uh, and again, you need to have this for your public spaces, for each different type of sleeping room, different meeting rooms and configuration of meeting rooms. Uh, restaurants, coffee shops, lounges, uh, features like golf courses, whatever it may be. Uh, video and virtual tours are certainly better as you get into the planning and buying stage. Uh, so uh, uh, you may see some usage of video in as people are considering your brand or your property or a destination. Uh, and, and that may be broader, higher level, such as, um, uh, let's just say, uh, the hotel's location um, in a resort destination uh, or adjacency to a conference center. But then the video uh, will be used more in the planning stage uh, as people get more engrossed. Uh, they want to understand more of the details. And this is also where virtual tours will come in. Um, which room type is better, which meeting space might be better for them. Uh, if you have multiple dining outlets, uh, which ones should they put on their priority list, uh, you know, and, and which ones um, uh, maybe uh, secondary. Um, you know, it's not as uh, video and virtual tours won't be used as much in the booking process because by then hopefully the customer is more confident. But that video and virtual tour may come back after booking uh, as the depending on when the guest is has booked and when they're traveling and even when they're on property to discover the features and amenities of your hotel. Uh, again, such as restaurants, lounges, spa, golf course, retail um, and other uh, services that you may be offering business center, um, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, don't forget, some of this content may turn into a potential revenue stream for you if you do it the right way. You could invite, for example, local merchants uh, or, or others to uh, 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 pay for product placement as you take guests through tours of, of the nearby neighborhoods or highlights of the city. That sounds interesting. Um, it also uh, is interesting. I think what I'm hearing from you is, is the different types of uh, visual content um, is um, used at each stage, but the reason why it's being used perhaps changes uh, based on the stage. And I think the, the example that I, I thought of when you were talking about it was um, after the booking uh, and looking at video almost in a post-purchase um, rationalization and making sure that, that one has made the right decisions and can uh, fulfill the the expectations of the trip that they want uh, when they get there. Yeah, I mean, you know, video content, virtual tours are an important part of the traveler's discovery process. Um, if you think about e-commerce in travel, uh, there are four stages. There's learning, there's planning, there's booking, and there's support uh, post-booking while the traveler is on their journey and between trips. The role of content is important in all four uh, of those stages, but it's going to take on different levels of importance and they'll be looking at different things. What, what travel companies, including hotels, don't realize is that it's really important to help that customer after booking to, especially uh, uh, if they're going to a resort destination, whether it's beach, 
or, or, or ski, uh, or if it's a conference uh, facility, to understand what your hotel has to offer. Uh, because we don't go to the hotel just to stay in our rooms. Uh, you, you, you want that guest shopping, dining, uh, enjoying the services of your property. Um, you know, you, you don't want to leave anything to chance. Uh, where, you know, hotels are in the hospitality business. Good content is an important part of that hospitality effort because you make the guest feel welcome. And that's an important part. You want to make that guest feel welcome at all stages of the planning, booking, and, and trip consumption process. Um, Henry, do you have uh, any insights or, or knowledge to help us understand where travel shoppers are actually viewing visual content? Is it more likely that they're viewing it on brand or hotel websites or third-party sites, or is it equally viewed amongst all of them? They're, you know, they're using it everywhere. We, we do not at Forrester have the specific data on this, but we do believe that good content can give a site a competitive advantage. So you do not want to allow a third party of any kind to have a competitive advantage. Uh, travel agencies, whether they are traditional or online agencies, invest in content, uh, and that may be their intellectual property. Uh, they certainly do a good job of helping you fill uh, beds uh, that, that you couldn't otherwise fill yourself. But you don't want to allow any third party, whether it's a travel agency or a consumer taking pictures and posting it on a social community site, uh, uh, to define your brand. You have a fiduciary responsibility uh, as the business professional over a hotel to make sure that your uh, content, your written content, and your visual content uh, is tangibly better than anyone else. If you work for a travel agency, you also want to make sure, of course, that your content is complementary and in line with that of your partners. Uh, and frankly, if your partners have content, maybe it allows you to save money on producing your own. Uh, so good content uh, has a role uh, in e-business. Uh, uh, it is important. What's also important to understand, search engines like Google, Bing, uh, uh, Yahoo, and others are increasingly returning visual content in the search results. So if someone does a search for, let's just say, comfortable four-star hotel in downtown San Francisco, uh, uh, if you have visual content that includes any of those keywords, you have an opportunity for that to be returned in that search result. All right. So it sounds like um, uh, the travel shopper, the consumer, is uh, consuming content uh, on all of the types of sites. And really, the, the, uh, the goal of the hotelier uh, is to ensure that the content that best reflects their hotel and their brand is the one that these travel shoppers are seeing, regardless of what site they choose to view it on. Absolutely. I mean, when you think about this, we live in a visual age. Um, uh, you know, whether it's television uh, or uh, streaming video online, um, looking at pictures, whatever it is, we are increasingly visually motivated. And you know, the saying a picture t you know is worth a thousand words is even more important in today's digital environment, especially with the uh, uh, growth of uh, new types of smartphones that have video capability uh, in them. So you want to make sure that you don't purposely allow someone else to have a competitive advantage uh, with visual content. You need to make sure that your visual content reflects your brand uh, attributes, uh, your product attributes, the, the things that distinguish your property from its competitors, uh, and you want to make sure that that content is easily discoverable uh, in terms of navigation, search engine optimization, uh, and access. Don't make it too hard for the customer to use this. Um, uh, you know, it, certainly it's great to have Flash, uh, but, but uh, don't let technology stand in the way uh, between you and the customer. Henry, thank you very much for sharing those insights with us. I'm looking forward to talking with you about our next topic, uh, the pillars of success in travel e-business. Thanks, John. Henry, welcome back. Thanks, John. 
And um, let's uh, address the uh, the next topic, the pillars of success in uh, travel uh, e-business. Uh, you recently published new research on effective e-business in a report titled Using Digital Channels to Calm the Angry Traveler. In this report, you introduced us to the concept of the five pillars of success in travel e-business. Can you share with us what those five pill pillars are, and can, can you give us a quick overview of them? Sure. Uh, there are five pillars to successful travel e-business. Uh, the first one is merchandising. Uh, merchandising is not about just cross-selling. It's about providing rich information, uh, multiple visual cues, well-written descriptions of different products so that the customer feels that they understand the benefits and attributes, both rational and emotional, uh, of a different product. It's about making sure that you cross-promote uh, and upsell in a rational manner uh, with uh, taking advantage of sales information so that, for example, uh, much like a retailer does, you are uh, either cross-selling or upselling based on logic, uh, not guessing. The second pillar is context. Uh, contextual information helps shift the customer away from price as the sole decision-making criteria. It provides useful, comparable information about similar products uh, so that the guest understands uh, what, let's say, two different types of sleeping accommodations may be and why one is worth the premium that may be charged over the other. The third pillar is engagement. Engagement is, engagement is especially important for hotel e-business these days, given the growth and importance of social media. Sites like TripAdvisor, Facebook, Doppler.com, uh, Twitter, uh, uh, blogs, and others allow consumers to communicate and post their opinions and share their content uh, with one another. So by having the right content on your site and allowing people to post their ratings and reviews on your site, you can engage that customer up front and keep them engaged throughout. The fourth pillar is value. Value, of course, is heavily weighted on price, but the role that content has here with value is making sure that the customer understands and feels comfortable about the products you're selling, whether they are different room types, meeting packages, uh, vacation packages, whatever it may be. Uh, what you want to do with value is, again, allow the content to shift the decision-making emphasis uh, away from price as the primary or sole criteria and have price be one of several, but not the exclusive decision-making criteria. But in a recession with 47% of travelers saying that they are allowing their budgets to dictate where they go, it's especially important you use content to make sure your hotel's value proposition is clear. The final uh, and fifth pillar of successful travel e-business is appreciation. Now, appreciation can be as simple as saying thank you, but some hotel companies go further by offering private communities which blend engagement uh, with appreciation because it is geared towards people who meet different criteria. It could be based on the destination they go to. It could be based on their frequency or financial value uh, that they represent to your brand. But there are a number of different ways in which you can say, thank you, you matter to me uh, through e-business. Henry, um, do you have any specific uh, examples or hotels that you know of that are using content uh, uh, in a particularly effective way uh, on those five pillars uh, of success? Sure. Uh, what I would say for merchandising is this is probably one of the weakest areas that we have seen, although uh, to their credit, uh, some of the higher end hotels like Four Seasons do a very good job 
with the photography that they use and having well-written descriptions. Marriott Hotels also does a good job with its written descriptions uh, of the rooms using a combination of paragraphs uh, and bullet points and allowing the customer to uh, choose from drop-down menus of different room types. Uh, in terms of context, Intercontinental Hotel Group does a very good job with the Intercontinental brand with matrix or grids of different room types there. Um, we think that in terms of engagement, uh, there's a website called tripkick.com uh, that, um, I'm sorry, John, let me go back uh, in terms of context. Mm -hmm. In terms of context, Intercontinental Hotels Group does a very good job with the Intercontinental Hotel brand. They provide a matrix of uh, different room types that allow people to understand contextually why one room type is different from another and hopefully justify the upsell. There's also a website called tripkick.com that provides information about different hotels and their room types, which rooms are larger or smaller, quieter, renovated, etc. In terms of engagement, we think this is a big opportunity for hotels. Uh, Starwood Hotels has done this effectively with Sheraton by allowing Sheraton guests to submit pictures of where uh, they've stayed and how Sheraton hotels have factored into that stay. Of course, tripadvisor.com allows people to submit ratings and reviews and pictures and so on, uh, and has established itself as a very trusted uh, site by travelers. In terms of value, we think Pan Pacific Hotels does an excellent job uh, with well-written synopses uh, presented of each different room type uh, to the hotel guest in the shopping path and pictures of the different room types as well. They make it easy for the guest to discover in that booking path through one click uh, uh, to get more detail on why one room type uh, may be better or different rate types such as a package or bundle rate. For the appreciation, uh, we think that Embassy Suites does an excellent job with its ambassador uh, private community for its top uh, honors guests who also happen to stay very frequently at the Embassy Suites chain. It sounds like how uh, hotels use their content and the type of content that they have is really um, the difference between whether they're uh, successful in one of these pillars or not. Now, it, it's interesting to me, um, some of the examples that you had, uh, Henry, certainly were ones that would be more prevalent on the brand.com site. What is, what is the, the risk of having that um, experience uh, on the brand.com site, knowing that travel shoppers uh, use a multitude of different types of sites uh, in their travel planning process? And how can you tie those two to, to, together? Well, I think, John, you have to understand, as you said, travelers are going to use a multiple, uh, of, a multiple number of sites to research uh, and plan their trips. General search engines like uh, Google, uh, meta search sites like Kayak, uh, online travel agencies like Orbitz uh, or Travelocity or Expedia, um, user review sites and the brand websites, all of these serve different roles and purposes. The reason travelers are using these different sites is, it's again, it's discovery. It's really nothing more or less than discovery and winnowing out what doesn't matter and narrowing the search down to what does. If you're on the hotel side, what you want to make sure is that your content really does show off your brand, its attributes, the property, the destination, not only in a way that's relevant and consistent with the promises you make, but in a way, frankly, that's just that much better, tangibly better, than any third party can do. Uh, now, you will never get 100% of your guests to come to your brand.com site. Some people are brand neutral, some are brand agnostic, some are actively brand disloyal, uh, and they trust third party sites and want to use third party sites. So you wanna make sure that your third party partners are using content in a way that's, again, helpful to you. Your job, frankly, with content is to use it to the betterment of your brand and your hotel and to make sure you're using it in a way that's smarter and more relevant for your guest than your competitor, the hotel across the street or down the block. That's really what this is about. 
because at the end of the day, you're going to be looking at how many rooms are occupied, the ADR you're getting, the RevPAR you're getting, uh, and the contribution all of this is making towards help your towards helping your business be more successful. Henry, uh, that's, so, that's, sorry, go ahead. You know, what I would say is, is too often we have an us versus them attitude in terms of suppliers versus intermediaries. I don't know any hotel in right now in this recession that can exist without the help of third parties. What you want to make sure of is that a third party isn't doing a better job with its content of representing your hotel than you are. You have a fiduciary responsibility as a hotel executive uh, to make sure that your hotel has the best available content. Uh, and then you want to make sure that your partners are using your content in the best available way. Henry, that's great information and uh, certainly important counsel and advice for hotels to know uh, and to integrate into their uh, e-business strategies. Um, while we were talking about uh, third-party intermediaries, it, it, it uh, um, brought to mind that that's another area where hotels struggle. Um, through um, our own research, we have found this as well. And uh, where they struggle with is, is what really is the role of a third-party website like OTAs, uh, which is an area for our next topic uh, that we will cover uh, um, uh, next. Henry Hardeveld of Forrester Research is here with me discussing the topic e-business for hoteliers, Hennessy or pain. Over the course of five specific topics, Henry and I are addressing how hoteliers can tackle the complexity and hard work of extracting more value from their presence online, and ultimately finding panacea rather than pain for, from their e-business activities. Henry, I've seen a fair amount of third-party research that would indicate to me that OTAs and similar websites actually play a much larger role in the travel planning process than merely as a booking engine. In fact, a senior person at one hotel chain we worked with told me that OTAs are the strongest lead generators for their brand.com site. You have stated in conversations and research reports, online travel agencies and third-party internet sites are the gateways to purchase consideration. So let's go into that uh, in a little bit more uh, depth and get your perspective on today's topic, why online travel agencies and third-party internet sites are the gateways to purchase consideration. For, let's start with why, why is it that OTAs and, and third-party sites are considered the gateways to purchase consideration? Well, uh, John, you know, there are so many different hotel chains and obviously uh, a large number of independent hotels. Online travel agencies discovered, frankly, uh, online travel planning and booking before many of the suppliers, whether it's hotels or airlines, rental car companies, cruise lines, uh, or others. And so the online agencies frankly, pioneered online travel planning and booking. And much like a traditional travel agent, uh, online travel agencies are great sources of discovery, of advice, uh, of learning for travelers who may be brand agnostic, brand neutral, or simply don't know which hotels uh, are located in a market and where may they may be physically located within a city or, or a destination. So travelers turn to the OTAs, uh, much like, if you will, a visual or digital yellow page uh, book uh, to learn about their options. Uh, and so uh, what online travel agencies can do is, as you said, to serve as a form of lead generation. Uh, the CEO of, of Expedia has said that 95% of the people who go to Expedia.com do not make a purchase there, but they are researching different products to buy and they go elsewhere to make that purchase. Uh, uh, many, uh, perhaps half or more, go on to that supplier site to make that purchase. So the OTA is very much an important partner uh, and an important part of the funnel, the, the marketing and sales funnel towards getting that customer. I've seen some research that would indicate uh, there was a question asked uh, of online travel shoppers and what primary tool they use uh, for planning travel online. 66% of them indicated the, that OTAs were their primary tool for planning travel online. Yet I've seen in, uh, research uh, where only 39% of bookings 
uh, and that may even be lower now, uh, happen on OTAs. So clearly, as, as quantitative evidence to your statement, uh, people are doing things more than just booking on OTAs. You're correct. I mean, our research shows that two-thirds or more of travelers will uh, uh, use an OTA to research uh, and that's actually uh, uh, been increasing slightly uh, as a result of the recession. Uh, the economic crisis is forcing travelers to be more uh, sensitive to their budgets. Uh, and uh, indeed, as I said uh, earlier, almost half of travelers allow their budget to dictate where they go, uh, the destination and other elements of their trip. So the OTA is a source of discovery for options. Uh, uh, destinations, accommodations, and other activities. And the, tr the hotel needs to make sure that if it's choosing to participate in an OTA, it has the right content on that OTA to stand out from the many, many other hotels that are out there. Uh, again, frankly, I don't know any hotel that can afford to not be on an OTA, uh, uh, at least any decent-sized hotel, uh, at the three star or higher uh, category, uh, because the travel agencies are just such important parts of the discovery and planning process. So it's it's interesting there. You you touched upon a point of of uh, of content, and I was going to ask you, um, what is it that a hotel can do uh, to their presence on these sites so that uh, they have a competitive advantage uh, over the competitors? Um, you know, is it content? Is it price? Is it reviews? What is it that hotels can do on OTAs to stand out from the competition so that they are not eliminated in the uh, travel shoppers um, uh, purchase process or planning process? Well, it's important to understand that there's a distinction between what a hotel can do on its own site versus an OTA. Uh, when you're for your own site, it's kind of like you're having people over to your home and you can serve what you want for dinner. Uh, you can make that your dining room look the way you want. You can behave the way you want, uh, and um, no one can throw you out. Uh, but when you go to the OTA, it's like you've been invited to someone else's house for dinner. Uh, there may be certain standards uh, or rules, restrictions, or, or uh, uh, limitations that the OTA establishes. Certainly, what you want to make sure that you do is that you don't hold back room types. Uh, 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 at least in terms of, of relatively plentiful room types. Uh, so hotels that have multiple room types but only put forth a certain category, uh, especially in this economy, are only doing themselves a disservice. The hotels, as a form of discovery, uh, help people understand what their options are. So if you have, let's say, standard, superior, and deluxe rooms, make sure that you participate with the OTA in terms of listing those room types and making sure that you have well-written descriptions and the right visual content. You may be able to negotiate with that OTA that they use your written descriptions and that they use your visual content and your virtual tours. Uh, that, and uh, uh, if they can, then obviously you have an element of consistency between what the guest sees on the OTA and what they see on your site. What you don't want to have happen, frankly, is where the OTA uh, has better content than you. That's wonderful in terms of the discovery for the, the traveler, but then they get to your site, and if your site doesn't have enough photography or has inadequate written content or bad quality video, one of two things happens. Either the guest goes back and makes that reservation on the OTA, which is higher cost for you, or they ignore you altogether and go along to the competitor uh, because again, you know, your hotel is listed in those results pages along with dozens of others. Right. You had mentioned that two thirds of uh, travel shoppers use OTAs uh, through uh, Forrester's um, research in, in that topic. Would you say that um, this holds true for both leisure and business travelers? Well, I think it's important to understand that in, when you, we talk about business travelers, that you have unmanaged business travelers, which are uh, acting who are acting very much like a leisure traveler, and you have corporate travelers that are managed. Uh, in terms of the managed environment, by default, they are generally going through a travel management company. They may be using a corporate booking engine. Uh, uh, they may also be using a call center uh, to do that booking. We know that managed travelers 
have a lower proportion of people who book their travel and a lower proportion of booking compared to unmanaged travelers who also don't have the resources managed travelers have. They may not have an administrative assistant or department person who does the booking and planning uh, for the, the traveler. I think that, that the unmanaged business traveler is searching for different types of content. Uh, uh, and it's not just about meeting space. They may be looking at things such as, uh, do you have high-speed internet access and is it Wi-Fi or wired? Uh, where is that available? And is it free versus fee? They may be more interested in your loyalty program. They may be more interested in details such as, uh, is your uh, are the rooms well insulated so that they can have confidential conversations and not have their neighbor hear them uh, or be disturbed by their neighbor? Uh, but also the, uh, the leisure traveler is probably more entertainment motivated using our technographics motivations, meaning that um, creative things will be more uh, of interest to them. Uh, Calendar-based shopping, value-based deals will be more important. The business traveler is going to be more career motivated. Uh, they're very much focused on efficiency, so well-designed sites, easy navigation, uh, fast-loading pages, but also uh, tools that allow them to, to compare and contrast. And again, going back to one of those pillars of e-business success, contextual information is extremely important to the unmanaged leisure traveler. If you can show not only why your hotel is better than uh, uh, its competition, but why the different room types are better, why your loyalty program is better, you have a better chance of winning that unmanaged business traveler. Thanks, Henry. It's, uh, it's obvious that uh, a hotel's online presence and, and how they use content for the specific uh, groups of, of customers or guests that they would have is important. Uh, you yeah, had one thing, John? Yeah. Um, you know, too often what we see is hotels will just take one picture of a sleeping room, for example, uh, or one picture of a restaurant or public area. It's a good idea not only to take uh, multiple pictures of details of the rooms or public areas, but to think about things that matter to the business traveler versus the leisure traveler uh, and to make sure that those travelers can find it. This is part of merchandising. So, for example, if you have a, uh, uh, a desk, don't just talk about it in the written description. Make sure that there's a picture of that desk set up as the guest would likely see it. Um, if, you've got a, uh, if you've got electrical plugs that are available, electrical outlets, excuse me, uh, that are available uh, on the top or sides of the desk, Make sure that those are either visible in the picture or that you point them out with a caption uh, or, or something like that. So the business traveler realizes, OK, they've got these little things that that matter to me. Uh, uh, you know, don't just show a picture of the room. Think through the different details that matter to the business traveler uh, and that matter to the leisure traveler. Yes, there will be some overlap, but there will be some things that are distinct to each group. Yeah, and, and certainly that, that also resonates with uh, comments that I've heard you um, say previously, and, uh, and that is that a lot of hoteliers could learn from how online retailers uh, merchandise and market online, and in particular, uh, how they look at the detail of the products and services that they provide to people, which is going to be a great uh, uh, entree into our next specific topic where we uh, address what hoteliers can learn from on time, online retailers. Great. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Henry, um, as we talked through your research you have uh, and your uh, uh, consulting work, you have um, discovered uh, that hoteliers can learn something from online retailers. Can you share some examples of what hoteliers can learn from online retailers and what online retailers uh, you consider to be successful? Sure. Uh, you know, online retailing uh, is good for hotels because, honestly, we are in the retailing business in travel. Uh, hotels are retailers. Um, it's, you know, you just let people sleep in your stores. Uh, what I think is important for uh, a hotel professional in a business to understand about online retailing is that no detail is too small. 
And if you take a look at some of the successful online merchants, uh, obviously Amazon.com, but also importantly, retailers like Tiffany, uh, 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 J. Crew, Land's End, Victoria's Secret, uh, and others. These are folks who uh, understand the value of a catalog. And that, in a sense, is what your website is. Your website is the catalog of your product, of your property, and the experiences you offer. Good retailers bring in professional copywriters who understand all the details. Uh, one of my favorite examples is J. Crew uh, and a shirt that they have, a men's white shirt. There's probably nothing more mundane or uninteresting in the world of apparel than a man's dress white cotton shirt. But J. Crew made this description sing by telling you about who the designer was and that it was precision tailored. Now you would hope a shirt would not be would not not be precision tailored, but they reinforced that little detail. It was two ply cotton. Maybe that's no big deal, but they are taking away any sense of doubt about what this was. Uh, every little detail was contained in the written description. They had multiple ways to look at the shirt. And again, a white cotton shirt is not a very complex or frankly interesting garment. But they had different close-ups of the shirt, the buttons, uh, the, the, the knit, uh, not the knitting, the sewing of, of the garment and things like that. So you realized what you were getting. And it was important for J. Crew because this shirt cost, if I'm recalling correctly, somewhere between $130 and $170. Uh, a lot more than the standard shirt, uh, and certainly a premium product. They had different ways to order it. They also cross-sold in a very thoughtful way. And it's, again, retailers have the advantage of stock keeping units or SKUs. We don't have that uh, in, in uh, the travel industry. But they still have to pull their uh, content from multiple databases. They still have to match it to what people buy, what they look at, what they put in their shopping carts and actually check out with. At least we in the travel business and hotel executives can do that. But I don't see too many hotel executives who apply this in their own e-business efforts. They push everything uh, to the guest, whether it's relevant or not. So it, it sounds like um, uh, one of the things that hoteliers can learn from on online retailers is how they've been able to take the detail of their products and almost turn it into more of an experiential um, uh, presentation uh, so that, uh, that their products um, are positioned more as a premium product and people are prepared to pay more money for them. Ab absolutely right. I mean, think about this for a limited service hotel, a three-star hotel. There are still things that you can do uh, especially if your hotel has just gone through a renovation effort, or maybe you're going green uh, with your uh, 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 property or other uh, programs or attributes that you can elevate. Uh, let's say you have 300 count sheets uh, on the bedding, on the beds. Uh, maybe there's something that you can sh uh, do to uh, merchandise that. Certainly you want to tell people, hey, we have 300 count sheets on our beds. Uh, but if you have hypoallergenic pillows, or if you are using uh, organic fair trade coffee in the restaurant or other things like this, you want to make sure that the guest understands this. But again, one of the things uh, J. Crew did is they had at least three different pictures of the item and you could uh, expand the view, you could drill down on it to get more detail within each item. Too often, we don't even see one picture for each room type at a hotel, let alone multiple pictures for that same room type that provide multiple different perspectives, let alone the ability to drill down into that to examine some of the details. Uh, maybe you have an alarm clock that has a charger for an MP3 player. Um, you know, show that so the guest understands where it is. You can use this not only to help in the discovery process, in the planning process, but in managing uh, the guest uh, pre-arrival uh, experience uh, and uh, helping the guest understand where things will be when he or she walks through the front door of that room. 
It sounds like um, uh, the retailers are, are, that you're um, citing uh, are using visual content more effectively than most hoteliers are using. They are, but they and they realize that this is this is what they're selling. I mean, they have you know whether it's a garment, a, a pillow, a piece of furniture, um, uh, you know who knows what it is. Even if it's uh, uh, an auto part, parts uh, store showing you a picture of whatever the gizmo, gadget, widget, whatever is, it lets you take a look at that, and then you can look at what you have and say, oh yes, that looks like what I have or what I need. And what you, when you think about this, what's really important for hotel executives to understand, every season, at least for uh, uh, retail merchants that are in the apparel business, things change. A portion of that inventory will go away. Uh, the, the it dress for this summer will be you know, a different one next year, meaning that some of this visual content and written content may have a shelf life of six months or less. But a hotel is renovated generally, you know, three to seven years. So your content has a longer term shelf life. You need to make sure it can stand up to the test of time. Um, it's interesting. It's, it it uh, is another case in point of the details uh, really tell the story. I'm often reminded, I saw a video of a small boutique hotel outside of Dallas where they spent uh, a good deal of time in their video talking about the almond um, pistachio crumble cake that they serve in, uh, at happy hour in the afternoon. And uh, it really told a nice story of the hotel, and uh, you wanted to go there just to have the crumble cake. You know, when you think about traveling, uh, whether someone is driving by road, uh, uh, traveling by train, uh, or, or flying, part of the hotel professional's responsibility, responsibility to that guest is to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Uh, you have to make that guest feel welcomed, uh, valued, appreciated, uh, and whole. And so, you know, details like the almond crumble cake, uh, or, aromatherapy in the, you know, or uh, other details help make your hotel stand out. No detail is too small. Maybe you use name brand products in your kitchen or as part of the cleaning. Uh, maybe you had a designer. We do a public space. Uh, maybe your uh, hotel is associated with certain professional organizations. Uh, again, there is no detail that is too small or too unimportant. The challenge for you as a hotel e-business professional is to make sure that you don't allow the details to trip up the guest as they're uh, learning about your hotel, as they're planning their trip, as they're going through the booking process, uh, and as you support them uh, during and between trips. So the hierarchy of the information, the manner in which it's displayed, the navigation structure for menus and so on on the website has to be thought through also with the same attention to detail and care. It sounds like there's a lot of things that uh, hoteliers can learn from uh, online retailers and how they approach uh, content on their websites. Uh, is there anything that online retailers do that hoteliers should not do? Well, um, I think, John, that that Retail and hotel uh, are, are, you know, fundamentally different businesses, even though hotels are increasingly retail. Uh, what I would say is that uh, uh, hotels do have to be focused, I think, on the fact that um, uh, yours is a considered, very carefully considered uh, uh, purchase. I wouldn't say that there's anything retailers do that hotels shouldn't do, but I think that hotels may want to take some things into consideration that retailers don't have to. Uh, for example, retailers may have to think about the safety and security of online shopping, but they don't have to think about details like weather. They don't have to think about details like personal security and safety on property and so on. So make sure that you don't ignore the things that do distinguish you as a hotel professional. Um, I don't think that uh, hotels need to go to the so-called one-click purchase path that some retailers offer. That's great for a book, but for a, re uh, for a hotel uh, uh, product, 
you don't want to miss the opportunity to upsell that customer, whether it is from a standard room to a better category room, uh, or to cross sell that uh, customer uh, on something, whether it is prepay for their telecommunications, prepay for parking, uh, cross sell airport pickup, or whatever it might be that, that your hotel can offer and, and deliver in a consistent manner. Henry, thank you very much. That's uh, another uh, session of uh, great insights for us. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us and exploring the topic e-business for hoteliers, panacea or pain. It has been a great pleasure having you on our show. Well, thank you, John. It's been a pleasure as well and a privilege. So thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you, Henry. To all the viewers out there, be sure to post your comments on this episode of VTV and subscribe to our feed to receive more valuable insights from industry experts.